I mean, it's absolutely crazy the way things have gone. Why? That's a million dollar question. I mean, if our parents could come back, they'd be ashamed of us. Are open one eight fifty seven one five. And is that what closed all those other pubs in in y'all? Um, that uh, we well, I suppose y'all is unique. We lost two and a half th two thousand to two and a half thousand jobs down here. So I mean that had a huge effect. Over what period of time? Um, in the space of about four to four to five years. During the period the late 1950s and early 1960s in the middle of the growth of the um, of industry in Yall. Yall was the only urban area in the whole country other than the big cities that actually had a growth in population. next week. Of course, eating bread is soon forgotten, as we know, but uh, that's the type of thing you had long ago. You had, uh, and uh, I know people were badly off and they uh, weren't able to pay for things, but they weren't hungry because people helped them out. And you had a neighborly sense from people. I mean, people give you the bite they were eating, you know. When I started work here in 53, they started me at 30 pounds a week. And I was staff, and I would get a company house and if and when I ever got married. And that all happened. I suppose we're all worried about what's happening now. Maybe it's just from years and years of apathy that they just feel down within themselves and there's almost like a cloud or an air of, an, an aura of negativity over the town. Um, from jobs, from a, from a social and economic point of view, we've gone backwards over the last 10, 15 years, where other towns um, of comparable size, like St Middleton, Dungarvan, they, they did actually benefit to a certain degree where you all just seem to have been neglected, totally neglected. Um, wh where would I put the blame on? Where would I put my finger on it? Like You'd have to put it, I suppose, squarely on the, the government that, we, that has been in power over the last, during, during that period of time, over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, you'd have to blame business leaders in the town. You'd have to blame the political representation in the town. It just didn't, your hasn't done its job. Sweet your my hometown by the sea, sure I'll always remember what your means to me. Oh, your sweet your my hometown by the sea, sure I'll always 
the number of people that you got to know or the friends you met every morning you know, I would say of the 800 people that I knew every one of them not personally but I knew them on the Friday you were all there chats you know this that and the other how they were getting on the problem things like that and Monday there was none of them there the, the place was blank you know it is that side of it that uh, all the people that you knew the friends you had and things of that nature that literally overnight the whole thing was gone and that uh, you know a whole way of life was gone everything is gone we had Murray's um, kitchens, we call it the mill, first of all, which developed into the kitchens outside, which was the radio factory. Now that's gone completely, right? Then you have the carpets, which was down there at the back, that's gone. That's, that really hit the dead nail last year when the last couple of looms of what we have now is a car park instead of a factory, right? Then you go out the strand to Blackwater like Cottons and Seafield Fabrics, they were the two, two great fa big factories, uh, they are gone. Uh, out the road here then you had Kodak and you had several little factories that started and uh, they're all gone. There's nothing left really, is there? It's, it's, it's scary, you know. A lot of other things that affect the town is the fact when you lose 2,000 jobs, the spending power disappears out of the town. Number one, people are down at least 10,000 if they go back in the door from their job. If they have to commute, you're talking about another 10,000. So in real terms, if you look at that, we're talking of a hemorrhage of our economy of at least 20, maybe up to 35 million a year um, that was there, say, back in the 90s. We've been elected, we, we've lost the jobs before everyone else in the country, but unfortunately we have the political will or the support to refill those plants. I have a small child, in, in, you know, she's four, she's going to be growing up in, in town. I don't want her to, to be going through the same difficulties as, as, as young people are having at the moment, having to emigrate, having to go to Cork or Dublin for jobs. We thought, like, you know, it was going to go on and on and on. There was a job going to Capital Factory and I got a note in the door there that I was to go down for an interview. There was about 50 people waiting for the same interview for the one job. The disappearance of an industrial base uh, from a somewhat different era on the one hand and then the, the changing structure of employment in the city and then more recently again the um, the development of um, shopping and commercial activities somewhat away from the town centre which leaves the town centre um, to fall into dereliction or disuse or the footfall uh, let's say um, uh, disappears from the town centre in the North American context, that's referred to colloquially as this kind of the donut effect, the emptying out of the town, and um, at the um, to the benefit of uh, suburban malls or exurban. They're not even suburban now; these are places four or five uh, miles uh, away from the town centre. And again, that's not just you all. The, the worst example of that in Ireland at the moment is probably Limerick. Uh, the development of Limerick, uh, you could imagine. Um, uh, on every access point to the city, from Galway, from Dublin, from Cork, whatever, there's a, a new commercial park, a shopping centre and so on. These are thriving centres in their own right and uh, you know some of them are runaway successes. For instance, the Crescent Shopping Centre in Limerick is one of the busiest shopping centres in the country and so on and so forth. But at, uh, at the cost often of the city centre itself. So Limerick is a very, very high rate of uh, empty commercial uh, uh, premises now and so on, on the main streets. Uh, Y'all is that on a, on a smaller scale. What struck me and has struck me over the years is that, I mean, if you walk down along the main street in Y'all, North Main Street and South Main Street, right the way down into Friar Street, there were businesses there. There were news agents, there was toy shops, there was sweet shops, there were drapery shops, there were hardware shops. And one of the great changes of being is that they, all of these were giving good employment in that. And um, 
everybody was very close knit. There was great sort of community atmosphere, and and there was also great atmosphere there because you could see all the businesses in in, in full flow, and. Um, it, the whole sort of structure and involved in the town was that people like Merrick's across the road again. I remember as a child, um, a lot of the staff in Merrick's would actually were people who came in, they would have been employed and picked up from uh, from other towns that, and they were actually used to, to live upstairs and they would live in there. And that was um, a big part of their business for, for many, many years. Unfortunately, an awful lot of the businesses have closed because of the impact of the larger um, multinational chains now, which is this stage, which is, I'm not begrudging at all, I mean, this is life, this happens. If you think about um, community in terms of the density or of the network of relations between people, and a very important part of that is, of course, uh, familiarity, uh, everyday interaction, uh, knowing people, knowing neighbours and so on and so forth. And we're not necessarily here now talking about something that has to be tightly knit because we are talking about town life it's not it's not like parochial in that sense the donut effect isn't just as a word than a spatial uh, physical effect it's uh, a profoundly sociological effect a, a loss of meaning a loss of occasions to talk things to talk about and uh, the possibilities of generating and maintaining shared understandings meanings and so on Probably the most difficult decision I've ever had to make, and um, again, like I had grown up, um, I was born above the shop. Um, I lived there. Um, I, like the personal, the personal sort of uh, attachment to that building is is terribly, terribly strong, and it still is to this day. Um, but we were sort of faced with the sort of the reality that we had to move. And again, what actually drove our decision, the main factor would have been car parking. And it was the lack of car parking in the town centre. And at the size that we're at, we knew we wouldn't be able to compete when the new Tesco was coming in and that we had no choice. As investments started coming into the towns, um, the investors wanted a bit more certainty. And that in, to some extent, they would have needed a bit of um, protection for their use. For, so for example, if they were bringing in business, they'd prefer to have an area dedicated to that kind of business, so um, be it a, a factory, a, a commercial enterprise or whatever. And we began to see the segregation of land uses, whereas originally our towns would have been very diverse. You'd have had people living over the shop and living over the business place and interacting in the kind of, the, that sort of fabric that we understood about traditional town life. Um, now we started to see segregation of land uses, so we saw very defined industrial areas, um, newly emerging housing areas and commercial areas separating. Um, and as programmes of, of bypasses and road improvements came, then they started to cluster around or follow the bypasses as they came along. We've seen, um, when a bypass goes in, we've seen development follow the bypass. Um, okay, it might move traffic out of the original congested town centre, um, but it also brings development with it. And there are examples of bypasses now becoming the new um, congested street, um, in a way. So there are a number of things which cause this, this donut effect to happen. Um, and you know, the effects are quite well known, um, especially when we're going through a phase of rapid change and rapid growth. Look at the um, the building we have here, and and uh, and the and the, 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 this property. The, um, it, this was this was not knocked back for for planning permission. By okay, by on board Planala, but there was there was objections by by business people in the town to that development. Now I'm not saying that there, there would have been a supermarket in here or of whatever nature. Or, or, no, but at least if if. The, the, the plan development had been given to go ahead, it would have shown the outside world that, yeah, you all is open for business. A terribly wrong decision would have been to put a huge shopping centre in where the Dunn Stores application was in there about a year ago. I feel if that had happened, it's not, um, I think we actually would have survived. I feel though that so many other, because there was a lot of shopping units going in out there as well, I think an awful lot of the infrastructure in the town would have been completely destroyed. Um, and our guidance is geared around the protection of town centres. Um, there is a, a sequential test which has been set up. So if a proposal comes in, there's a test, a series of tests that you have to, to, have to apply. If for some reason appropriate amounts of land in the town centre aren't available, you go to the edge of the town centre, within walking distance of the town centre where people can compare 
and, and continue their comparison habits of shopping. Um, if the edge of the town centre isn't appropriate, only then do you consider moving beyond that into the edge of town. And only at the very last resort do you go out of town. We, we never saw the Celtic Tiger here really in the all, you know. Mm -hmm. Celtic, Celtic Tiger, was a, to my mind, was a complete myth for Jews. Uh, uh, I don't know what, but it, put, it gave people a false sense of things that things are booming, you know. Mm -hmm. And now look at the way they are at the moment. I mean, the, at the moment, if you think about it at all, it's very frightening altogether. There's nothing but discontent everywhere. Looking down at the television every night, night after night, jobs going, jobs going, and there's all sorts of uh, kind of uh, a false thing about uh, you're being told there's something that we're going to, everything is going to recover. Who knows? I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen at the moment. Today you have nothing in the street, as you can see out there, there's nothing at all. There's a couple of supermarkets outside the town and they do any business that's to be done. I mean, that's, that's the way it really has changed and the small shops are all gone. The increasing loss of distinction between town, city, country and so on. Uh, because it's not just the town and the suburb and so on is at stake here, but also the proliferation of one-off housing, for instance, so that, you know, uh, the proliferation of places and families growing up uh, that are no longer certainly agricultural, they're not tied to the land, they're not tied to any locality, they're not tied to any particular community, but are nonetheless living in the country in some way, but it's no longer the country and so on. And that loss of distinction is very much part of the problem. If you don't know who you are, if you don't know where you're living, if you don't know... There's a generalised loss of sort of meaning, attachment, purpose and so on. And of course when things get bad, as they are now, uh, however bad things are as a result of uh, the confusion that comes with accelerated development, accelerated de-development or accelerated depression, as, as we're seeing at the moment, is going to exacerbate those problems, I, I'd imagine, quite, quite, quite severely. There's a, a tax incentive to revitalise um, seaside resorts, which we had, and examples of uh, are many in the southeast of, of Ireland. Um, we suddenly find that there's a tax deadline by which certain developments have to be pushed through the planning process, either permissions or refusals. And we suddenly found the agenda to roll out more um, tourism accommodation becomes um, a priority, and the speed of doing it in order to avail of tax incentives becomes the priority rather than the pace, the appropriateness of the locations and so on. We can't go back to the apartment blocks that has been built already like the Allen's Key for example is totally out of tier with the rest of the town. It's like as if you just put a big huge spear. It's like giving the Twin Towers and putting them into the centre of y'all. It just doesn't work. We're left with uh, apartment blocks that are half empty, sorry 90% empty, a lot of them. Um, 
you know, they, they're, they're, they're falling to disrepair. Uh, there's graffiti. So not, not only did, did they not have a positive effect in the town, but in a lot of ways they're having a negative effect. There has been the sense in Ireland up until now, perhaps it's been focused a little bit more with things like global warming, flooding, traffic congestion, and the real observ observable um, weakening of town centres. Um, we began we begin to realise that if you make a bad planning decision, that it's not it, that it's somehow a victimless crime. That you know what harm if we got that bit of zoning wrong? Sure, sure, it won't be okay. It won't actually be okay because now, as we start to look at the cumulative effect of all of these individual, you know, marginal planning decisions, perhaps perhaps not spectacularly failures, um, but we're beginning to see the effects. And so we say no, actually, bad planning isn't. There, there isn't victimless. There are things that happen, and in these kind of things that you're raising, it's it's it's, it's a one way of manifesting it. The Strand Palace is one of the most, uh, I suppose, unsuitable buildings ever built on a seaside resort. It's totally out of kilter with the whole area. Um, we sacrifice our main tourist attraction area in the Strand. That it, bad planning is down to the fact that. The people actually making a lot of these planning decisions and people making zoning decisions, say for example the councillors making zoning decisions, I really believe that that, that uh, power should be taken out of their hands. The people making zoning decisions really should be left to the people who are qualified to do that. And when they're doing that, uh, it, should be, it shouldn't be just about the individual development that's taking place, it should be the effect that's going to have on the rest of the town from a positive and negative point of view. So I mean, these buildings are up now, we're going to have to stick them for the next 100 to 200 years. I honestly don't think there's a collective will within the the powers that be, be it be it the, the, the business people um, or, or, or representatives to to pull pull together to to find the, the right answers to, to to solve the problems that are there. We all got carried away, and property was the name of the game, and that was it. There was no other game in town. Because I think now at this stage there's a realization that things have to change, and I would be um, optimistic that the town centre and the Tony Hall will have, but I think we need to look at our tourism potential now at this stage. When you think of a place like Yall, for example, you think of its counterparts in elsewhere in Ireland, the, you know, the, the, the places of mass tourism in the Victorian era, uh, you know, Bray, for example, or other places near the big cities, um, they've reinvented themselves in different ways in different places. In Britain, you think of places like Blackpool, still a very um, you know, mass tourism location, and then other, other places, you know, Skegness or or um, Scarborough, places which are going more up market, they're looking for a more grand vision of themselves to, re to re re reinvent themselves. And places like Yall are kind of stuck in that um, they, they don't know which way to lurch. We will actually have a lot more to offer than any other tourist resort in the country, but we have to get out there and market it to its full potential. Yall Strand would be black with people coming down from Cork. 5,000 people in the Strand. And they're all going to the cafe and getting buying things in the uh, little shops. It's meant an awful lot of business to the town, to the strand, and everybody using the rail. And uh, it, that could come back if the rail was back, but uh, it's not happening. Railway enthusiasts need not be too cast down. All is not lost. Good trains will still continue to operate along the line morning and evening, and in the summer, if summer ever comes there'll be excursions. But still, there will be a little less excitement traveling between Cork and Yaw. The train came down from Cork, and you paid for your ticket, I think it was 10 shillings, and that also gave you entry into the showboat. Towns that were thriving 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 300 years ago or even longer fall into decline and they uh, fade from the significance and so on and their place 
in history as in, in the past, really. I don't know how long it's going to take to get back to, uh, to, to, to doing anything again. Things will have to change, really. How they're going to change is another thing. I think the old values will start coming back into focus a lot more now because we all need to help each other more than ever before. There, there was a great saying in our business over the last couple of years that people were cash rich and time poor. Well, now it's actually gone the other way around again. are closed and the, and, and, the, and the curtains are pulled, that's it, it's gone.